Come right here. Cecily works as an archivist at Douglas County Libraries. She's a Castle Rock native, having graduated from Douglas County High School with a bachelor's degree in architectural history from Arizona State University. She furthered her education with a master's in museum studies from the University of Oklahoma and a master's in library and information science from San Jose State University. Having dedicated over 12 years to Douglas County Libraries, she spent the last eight specializing in archives and local history. A standout moment in her career was inter interning at Ellis Island, focusing on materials related to the 1986 restoration of the Statue of Liberty. She currently lives in Castle Rock with her husband and daughter. Please give a warm welcome to Cecily. Thank you, Sarah. Wow, there's a lot of you. Um, it's been a long time since I've presented to such a big group, but thank you all for being here. This is very intimidating, um, but we're gonna have a great time. Um, so first of all, as Sarah said, so I'm one of the archivists with Douglas County Libraries. Hannah, who's over there at the table, she's my, my co-archivist. Um, so we are a team of three. There's both of us and then Daniel, who's our curator. So there's three of us um, down at the Archives and Local History. Down at, we are located in the Castorot Library. Um, but I'm going to talk way more about our department after I talk about good old Samuel Long. Um, and so we'll get started. I will say I know that there are way better experts in this room, so that's also really intimidating. Um, but I'm hoping one or two things will be something new or at least interesting. So um, just a little about what we're going to talk about tonight. So I'm going to talk about good old Sammy. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about my department, and then Sarah also asked that we talk about the Highlands Ranch Historical Society oral histories um, that are part of our collection at the library. Um, so, and then I'm going to talk about uh, just library stuff in general. So, uh, with that, as you all know, Sarah just read my bio, um, but just real quick, so um, my introduction to archives and Douglas County Libraries, so, um, well, first I'll do a survey because this will kind of help me gauge how to present tonight. How many of you have been living in, in Colorado, Douglas County for more than 30 years? Awesome, okay, great. I meet so many new residents, which is also exciting, but then it's also like, man, <laughs> there's a lot of new people. Um, how many of you have been here less than five years? A few, okay, great, welcome. Um, so, like I said, I, um, so I claim I'm a native. We moved to Colorado when I was 10 years old, um, which y'all might think I'm super young. Thank you, but I'm not. Um, so, and then when, we, when I turned 11, we moved to Castle Rock. So I grew up in Castle Rock. My mom worked for the library for 20 years as a cataloger, so she worked behind the scenes. And I um, literally grew up in the library. I said I would never work at the library, and look at me now. Um, so I actually, for those of you that have been around a while and you remember Johanna Hardin, um, she started our department and she was my mentor. I worked with her when I was in high school. I did my community service hours with her. And then um, in 2005, I started working at the library in archives. I was there for um, seven, eight years. Then I moved into admin. So I've been with the library off and on um, for 12 years, just finished my first year back. Um, so I've been around for a while, um, and I've, um, the department is really my, my life, um, literally. <laughs> um, and so it's really great to be back and be able to present to all of you tonight. So let's get to why you guys are here. Um, Mr. Samuel L. Long. Now I will say, Mr. Samuel L. Long is incredibly hard to find. <laughs> um, so we're going to go over what I could find. Um, thankfully, the um, websites uh, related to the mansion and such were super helpful. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about the resources I used to find Mr. Long as well. Um, but anyway, he was born April 6, 1827 um, in Pittsburgh to Reverend Joseph D. and Sarah A. Miller. Um, he was the second of seven children, and those are all of his siblings listed there. Um, I also found it very interesting his brother was one of the House of Representatives in Pennsylvania. And then this is just a little map from the year he was born. So you can kind of tell Pittsburgh is like, oh, I have a little clicker thing. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Present. Just kidding. Here we go. Present. Nope. 
There we go. All right. I'm going to do a little more. No? I'm like, oh well. Anyway, we'll move on. So anyway, right in the middle. It's Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> so his young life, young life, one of the things I found really, really interesting about him as you look at like census records and the few things that you can find of him is that every single time he's listed somewhere, his career is different. <laughs> <laughs> um, so sometimes he's listed as a farmer, sometimes he's a miller, sometimes he's, um, he's working with like textiles and the railroad and all kinds of different things. So every time you see his name somewhere, he's doing something different, which is really what kind of guard, it changed his life was that he was very much an entrepreneur and he really like found um, the railroad industry and stuck with that and then he also did um, the other things out here. But that was one of the things that really struck me as I was doing re research about him was that Every sign, like every 10 years, he's doing something different. Um, and so I think he just got bored a lot, really. Um, but you know, in the 1800s, what else was there to do? So um, another interesting thing about him. So this is, um, well, I'll talk about the map in a second. So he marries Henrietta Fenton in 1881. And they were actually um, older when they got married, which was kind of surprising for the time. Um, she was in her 40s, he was in his 50s. Um, and she came from Canada and she was a music teacher, which I love. Um, and so I actually looked up her address. She, this is from the 1879 city directory in um, Philadelphia. And so the little teeny tiny star kind of at the bottom left is where, her, where she lived um, and where she taught music. Um, and it is right next to, like literally a block away from the current um, Philadelphia Convention Center. Um, it's now like a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> um, I was gonna do like a Google, like the Google Maps picture of it, but it's not, it's not a great picture. Um, but it is, she was right there, um, right in downtown Philadelphia. Um, so I think that's really interesting. That's one thing that I really love is maps, um, if you couldn't tell from the maps I've already shown. But, um, so that was one of the fun things. So they, um, so they get married in 1881. They had no children, like I said, they were older. Um, so I really, I really wanted to find either like a marriage announcement or something about like how they met or how they fell in love or why they got married, but that doesn't exist. I'm sure it exists somewhere probably, but I couldn't find it. Um, so with that, here's, here's Samuel, as you've seen his picture when you're walking in tonight. Um, but like I said, he did many things. So he served on the board of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Um, he served on the Pittsburgh City Council and he was also president of the Philadelphia and Pittsburgh Coal Company. Um, he also served on boards and started um, the, now I'm not going to remember it, um, the Erie, Clear Creek, and Denver Railroad out here. Um, but really, the railroad was really what um, he was super interested in and what uh, he continued to build while he was in Colorado um, until he went into agriculture. So in the 1880s, he comes to Colorado. And if you look in, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but Homestead Records, the BLM Records, um, you'll see his name kind of around Colorado, not just in Douglas County. Um, but I couldn't really verify that it's the same Samuel Allen Long, but there's one, there's Homesteads in Bent County, in Boulder, and here in Douglas County, obviously. Um, but I think he kind of just traveled around a lot until he really settled here. Um, and so he and... This other guy from Philadelphia, they're stopping at the, I did find a picture of the American House Hotel, which was in Denver, um, which is like, yeah, he stayed there. Um, so that's kind of fun. I also really like that they like to advertise the steam heat <laughs> um, and the electric lights. As um, I went to school in Arizona, totally side rant, so you can ignore this part, but um, there's a theater in there, the old Orpheum, which was built in the 1920s, and I love that they would put the blocks of ice under the seats to keep people cold because they didn't have air conditioning. Um, so that's what I keep picturing here in this, like, yeah, um, all the fancy new things in the American House Hotel. And then um, this other news article of him selling his residence to his wife um, for $2,000, which I also find very interesting because um, this would have been right, either right before or right after they got married. Um, so I found, that interesting, and we'll talk about a little bit about these historic newspapers later on. So there we go, the Erie, Coal Creek, and Denver Railroad, um, which he was one of the charter members, he was chosen as president, um, and then he continues to do that. There's a lot in the newspapers about um, this part, and he um, was also with his, with his younger brother, um, the one that was the um, House of Representatives member. Um, they were both working on this railroad. 
And then um, it's also like, because again, they're looking over like the mineral resources and he's very interested in all of these different things with industry. And um, yeah, he's just, I don't know. I just really wish we could find more about this guy. And, or if we, I, again, I wish we had an oral history by him. <laughs> um, because I think just his interests were just so varied that he really just wanted to be busy and he really liked investing in different companies and figuring out um, kind of that industrial spirit here in Colorado. Um, so here in Douglas County, um, right here, so this is um, the notice in the local newspaper in 1888. He actually filed in 1884, um, but then of course it took a while for him to actually get the homestead and actually get it um, with the land office. But this is this property that we are here um, on right now, and we'll do a little map in a second. But um, so this is him homesteading this area, and then again, and it's interesting like finding the sources behind um, all the things. But it, this is also where I found that he was the president of the Philadelphia and Pittsburgh Coal Company, um, and saying that he is here. And as we knew from our earlier trivia questions, right, the name of his ranch, um, Rutherwood. And so that was also, um, I tried to look up more about Rutherwood and I couldn't really find a whole lot aside from there was a place in Tennessee that was named Rutherwood and I couldn't put the two connections of like, if that was actually the one that he was talking about. But, um, but yeah, so he had named this place Rutherwood Ranch with his original homestead. Um, so here's the homestead record on the left. This is actually um, one of the later ones. And then what it looks like now. So obviously we are, the little purple dot at the top is where we are right now, the mansion. And so that's his property um, kind of to the left and then down. And then this bottom right part, it, that's his sister-in-law, Sarah Fitton. Um, so she had property here as well, which again, I find very interesting um, that they were all here. And also when his brother died, um, they mentioned how all of them came from Pennsylvania and came to, they all kind of came to Colorado um, and they kind of became this big, huge kind of group of people that were all here. So, um, and yeah, we'll talk more. This, this image on the left is from History Geo, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but I like seeing, and what I should have pulled. So one of our collections is um, aerial photos and that's what I, I totally forgot to pull the 1937 era. But anyway, um, so this is kind of one of the more interesting parts. Again, he's very he's interested in a lot of different things. And out here, as you all know, aside from the two feet of snow we all just got, um, it's dry out here, right? We're up here and the elevation is dry. Um, so he really helped develop um, this idea of dry land farming, which is basically letting the land rest and letting it build up the minerals and the nutrients and all of that to then harvest it again. And so it's funny in all of these newspapers, like around the state, how he's really bragging about this system that he's come up with and how he's like going into town and telling people how much, he, how much corn he's grown and the trees he's grown and all of that stuff. Um, he's really bragging about it. <laughs> um, I don't know, I think that's kind of interesting, but there's, there's a lot more than just these, these articles about um, all of this. The timber, um, his, as they were telling me earlier today, um, his original trees are still out there. Um, and so that's all of these, um, the forest culture and all of that stuff. So, um, and I know this is really, really hard to read, but basically um, this first one on the left, he came, he came into Denver with some sample ears of corn um, grown at this place, Rutherwood, without irrigation. They are full, close, and even, and compare very favorably with the best showings of corn from Nebraska or Kansas, though perhaps not quite so large. And then Rutherwood is about 10 miles southeast of this city. But yeah, I think, it, and then this is still a technology that's going on today where they're trying to figure out how to grow um, all sorts of things without, without water, but he really helped develop that. Um, and then also, just throwing that in there. He was a founding member of the Colorado Beach Sugar Association, which he pops up in the newspaper a lot. So, um, but one of the things that um, once he kind of developed this area and he built his um, farmhouse here, and then in 1891 he sold his property to John Springer, and then John Springer went on to build um, all that we see here. But the really interesting part is that he sells off all of his properties in 1893, and we don't really know why. Um, we think that it was just before the silver crash in 1893, so we think that might be why um, he was kind of preparing for, um, for that um, and trying to save his, his money and time. So with that, um, and they said that they didn't, in the newspaper, it says he sold his ranch um, and they did not learn the price 
but we know that he sold it to Orrin Wade in July of 1893 for about $12,000, which in today's money is about $430,000. Um, so we think he was just trying to get rid of the land, really. And then um, he and his wife moved to the Ladies Relief Home in Denver, and they have several articles of them enjoying time at Christmas um, up in Denver, and they continue to live there. And he likes he, he reads a lot to the women in the in the house, and he does speeches for them and all kinds of things. And then um, so he dies November 11th, 1905. Um, and this was the big um, obituary that was in the Rocky Mountain News from him, um, or about him. And, um, and then his wife goes on to live for another eight years. She died in 1913. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting that, like, I just wish we could know, like, what happened um, for him to be moving up to Denver. They moved to this, um, this aid home, and then he's there. And then um, he's considered an invalid, and they've sold off all of their property, and we just don't know what happened. <laughs> um, there's just so little um, like documentation. So um, with that, and then I'm trying to see if there's anything else. Yeah, came to Denver in 1880. Um, he was in Boulder for a while, like I said, and then of course he had the property down here. Um, and then he was also with, um, again, his family did a lot of things. And so he and his wife were both buried in Falmont Cemetery in Denver. And you can go see their, their tombstone there. And this is just another drawing, drawing of him. So with that, so I know that's kind of like, huh. <laughs> um, but like as I was telling others earlier today, it was definitely, he's a hard guy to find. And this is the struggle that we have with our archives. And this is why we want people to be donating their stuff to us because people think that we just magically have things in the archives, wherever you may go, not just us, but other archives, and it's like, no, we need you to give us things. Um, we can't just magically create records. And so for him, it's like, yes, I would have loved to have an oral history from him or a newspaper article or something else to just be like, this was his life and this is why he got married and this is why they sold off their property and all of those things. Um, but we kind of have to put those pieces together. Um, so with that, I'm going to move on to um, the next little part of my talk. And again, I am more than happy to talk more about Samuel and talk about the resources and things that I used to find. We'll go over a little bit here. But um, so to move on to, um, to us in the library, so the archives. Um, how many of you know about the archives and local history at the library? A few of you. OK. Um, so, for those of you that don't know, Douglas County Libraries, we do have an archive. We are kind of um, a rare breed in the public library world to have our own archive. But we started in 1991. The Douglas County Historical Society disbanded. They had been housing their materials at the Castle Rock Library and just like left it, like people could just come and take stuff. And it was just out in the library and people would come and put stuff in if they wanted to and then they would take stuff out. And so when the Historical Society disbanded, they came to the library director and said, hey, we don't want this stuff anymore. You figure out what to do with it. And he was like, OK, we'll do that. So Johanna Hardin was our book mender at the time. And he went to her and said, figure this out. So we started with eight beer boxes and a filing cabinet. Um, that was everything that we had in the Historical Society collection. And now we are still actively collecting today and doing presentations like this to talk to everyone about what we have. So um, you might have heard, we were the Douglas County History Research Center for a while, and in 2018 we became Archives and Local History. We are located on the second floor of the Philip and Jerry Miller Library in Castle Rock, um, and we reopened in August 2023 in the new library. So our mission, I'm not going to read all of this to you, basically we collect the history of Douglas County. Um, if it's part of Douglas County, we want it. Um, as Douglas County did originally reach to the Kansas border, um, we can kind of get away with collecting Albert Kit Carson counties as well. Um, this is a beautiful picture of downtown Castle Rock in the 1880s. Um, you can see the courthouse, which burned down, and the um, train station, which got moved, which is now the Castle Rock Museum. Um, the Cantrell School is out in the back, and then, of course, the rock. So um, this is one of the pictures in our collection. Um, who we work with? Obviously, the historical societies, local governments, cities, um, museums, other libraries, the school districts, um, even higher education. We work with the Historic Preservation, the Land Conservancy, um, 
We work with kind of a little bit of everybody. We've worked with the local news stations in the past. Um, we just had researchers a couple weeks ago that have a YouTube channel that do like weird, quirky stories of Colorado. Um, so they were just in doing some research. And then of course, community groups, professional associations, um, the chambers. Um, we work with literally anybody that's interested in Douglas County history. Um, our collections, so we have a little bit of everything. Um, the county has its own repository, which has like the big stuff like the farm equipment and like the fencing, um, but we really are paper-based. So we have photographs, letters, business records, scrapbooks, um, newspa newspapers, um, ephemera, maps, our aerial photos. The aerial photos are my personal favorite. They date back to 1937. Um, we've got microfilm, which nobody ever looks at anymore. Um, and then we've got a little bit of everything. And this is just an example of some of the stuff that we have, um, like uh, population records, um, yeah, photographs, microfilm. This is the bottom right is a picture from the 1965 flood, and then our um, aerial photos. So a day in the life, like what do Hannah and I do all day, aside from come out and talk to all of you wonderful people? Um, so when we get a donation in, it usually looks like the picture on the left, right? You've all seen that in your basements, um, the boxes of just stuff. And then it comes to us and we make it look beautiful and put it in folders so people can find it later and do research. Um, one of my favorite things is a couple years, well, maybe about 15 years ago now, we got a donation from... Uh, the town of Castle Rock that still had a Slim Jim in it, like the beef jerky stick. And yeah, it still had like the price tag on it. Yeah, it was great. Um, we did not keep the Slim Jim for any sort of exhibit purposes. Um, but we do find really, really interesting things in our collection. Um, so a lot of what we do is processing so that we can make this available for you all when you want to come do research with us. Um, obviously we do research requests, we do presentations like this. I like going out and talking to people about the things that we do. Um, we do meetings, Hannah and I both serve on professional development boards. Um, of course we're writing and editing, um, we also have um, a traveling exhibit that will hopefully come be coming out later this year that'll be going around to all of the library branches. And then of course the famous other duties as assigned. Um, so we are actually part of community engagement. So when you guys, you guys are all coming to our table and telling us how much you love the library, um, well, we are part of the community engagement team which is doing all of the big events, um, summer reading program, Forest of Stories. If you, if you went to any of the libraries over the holidays and you saw the trees, we help with that. Um, we kind of do a little bit of everything now. We're kind of we're different that way um, in that we are under that and we're not just stuck in the back just working with archival materials. Um, and then one of the things I wanted to talk about was um, some of the resources that we like to use that we help um, share with people. So the one on the left, History Geo, we actually have um, this handout here over on the table. For those of you that don't know this, um, it is their, one of their projects is First Landowners. So if you're doing any prop, um, property research and you want to know who the first homesteader was or the first landowner was for that land, this will show you. It's on a map. Um, it'll link you to the BLM. Um, it's a really, really great resource, so I highly recommend them. That's what I used and was showing you earlier um, tonight with that presentation. Um, History Drio is a really, really great one if you're doing any land, any land research. Um, the Colorado Historic Newspapers Collection. Our newspapers are online. They date back from 1881. They go up to 1994. They are all keyword searchable. So when you are wide awake at 4 a.m. and you want to figure out what people were talking about in the 1920s, you can go on and read it. Um, it's obviously not just Douglas County. It's all of Colorado, but we have the most, like the biggest range of years. Um, we are like probably one of the most recent collections up there. Um, but it's the West Creek Mining News, Castle Rock Journal, The Record Journal, um, all of Douglas County. So if you want to know the gossip of what was going on, it's amazing what, what ends up in the newspaper in the 1920s. But um, yeah, the old advertisements, like I get sucked into it for hours. So that's all the newspaper articles I showed earlier. Um, we're from there. And then the Digital Public Library of America and Plains to Peaks are basically the same thing. They pull from our online catalog. So if you're doing research, you can find them there. Um, and then the General Land Office, the Bureau um, of Records Man or the Bureau of Land Management is also the same thing with the History Geo. Um, and then the Veterans History Project actually has kind of changed a little bit, um, but that's a partnership we have with the Library of Congress where we have volunteers going out and interviewing veterans about their experience and it's an oral history interview and then we transcribe that and put that online. Um, so we have several of those as well. Um, so that's one of the things that um, 
We are looking for people to interview our, um, our veterans in the county. We have a lot of people that want to do interviews, um, but we are looking for someone to actually actively be out there interviewing. Um, and then we have volunteers that are transcribing those, those interviews and putting them um, online in our collection. Uh, one thing Sarah wanted me to talk about was your own Highland Ranch Historical Society oral histories, which are available on our website. Um, so this is what it looks like if you go to our website and then under um, research, you can just search for Highland Ranch Historical Society and it'll pop up. And these are both the videos and the transcripts. So you can watch the video and read the transcript at the same time. Um, and these are really, really amazing videos. We love having them in the collection and they are very well produced. Um, so they're definitely, people want to know how to get to them. So basically you can just go to our website and search for the Highland Ranch Historical Society. Um, and it's just oh, it's, its own collection. And yeah. That's about it. Um, yeah, any questions? Yes, ma'am. One of your earlier slides um, had something in it that said Civil War. Was, was he involved in the Civil War, Samuel Long? Yeah, so he had um, a draft record for that. Um, but again, I couldn't find anything else about um, like where he where he served or what he did. Um, but yeah, there is a, um, a Civil War registration form for him. Was he Union or Confederate? Yeah, Union. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, again, it was kind of minimal information, so. Hi, um, how much land was here that he purchased? That is a great question. Um, there you go, 40 acres. Oh, how much land did he purchase? No, I read 40 acres. Yeah. He grew it to 2,000. There you go. See? Was there any indication of how he died? I don't, I think it was just old age, honestly. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, what uh, he was totally immersed in Pennsylvania, uh, what prompted him to come to Colorado, number one, and then Douglas County has you in your position, and the other counties in Colorado have you? Mm -hmm. Um, and I, honest, I, I think it was the railroads, because the railroads were starting to come through Colorado, that that was, he probably saw an opportunity to invest in building the railroad, having the, build the railroads expand out here. Um, I don't honestly know if that was, that would be my assumption, was that was, that was kind of the first thing that brought him out here, and then he just kind of kept growing. Um, but it was also, again, in the 1880s, he was in his 50s, and then, you know, he, it sounded like he kind of had built his, this career, and then he was like, let's go expand in Colorado and go make some money. Um, and then secondly, yes, so there are several, um, Jefferson County has, um, well, it's not in the library, but they have an archives department within the county. Um, Colorado Springs has an archive, uh, Pueblo has an archive, Denver Public has their own archive, um, which is the Western History Collection, that's probably the biggest um, archive aside from the state in History Colorado um, that's close by to us. Um, but yeah, the, the kind of the central Denver metro, there's us within the public libraries, but as you kind of expand out, there's fewer and fewer of us, so yeah. Do you have a picture of the, his farm? Because I, on my, in the web, I saw some little shack thing, but was, wasn't it larger before he sold it to the Springers? I didn't see that he had built and again, y'all can correct me. Um, I didn't see that he really built a whole lot before Springer took it over and then built the bigger, aside from that, that original farm, yeah. farmstead. Yeah. yeah, there's a picture of it right in the lead. Yeah. On the right, you built a 30 by 50 stone house. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me, when I first saw the advertisement for Long, 
I associate it with Long's Peak and Rocky Mountain National Park. Is he named? Is named after him, or is it? Uh, yeah, a different. Different. Yeah, I believe it's a different long. Oh, is it the same long? Okay. I was like, I didn't think it was the same long. Yeah, Stephen Long. They're all S's. Any other questions? Okay. Well, Susie or Sandy, would one of you tell us about the uh, the Rutherford up yes. on the front of the building? Yeah. the real microphone. <laughs> okay, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Susie Appleby. I'm the Historic Programs Coordinator here at the mansion. And uh, we do have a lot of docents that are here that know a lot about Samuel Allen Long, but that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Susie. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, so yes, Sarah asked about Rotherwood, so when you leave tonight, if you'll go out into our entry room and take the door on your right hand side, it's a much smaller door than the big one that you came through the, this evening, that is what we call our Rotherwood entrance, and when you go out that door and look straight up, you'll see some carvings above that door, and that is the word Rotherwood. And that was something that was discovered back um, in 2010 when we were doing a renovation of the mansion and that roof was in, in really horrible condition. So we had to repair it and in taking down some of it, that word was uncovered so we had no idea the word was there ever. So um, just a recent discovery. So if you take a look at that, when you're walking out, you'll see that. So the, I mean, like she said, that is the name of his farm. Um, as far as we understand, he named it after a, um, a, a farm that he admired back in Pennsylvania when he was a boy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. And thank you for letting us come to the mansion. It's always wonderful to be able to be here, to have a program here. And thank you very much. And thank you, Harlan, if you're here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you to our speaker tonight. Thank you. If you have any more questions, I'm sure they, they'll be around to answer your questions. If not, enjoy your evening. We'll look forward to seeing you at the next program. We'll be back, back at Southridge on the third Monday of April. And we'll be doing learning about Elvis. So look forward to Elvis coming.